Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us today for a webinar on the beneficial reuse of sand resources. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the Monmouth University Urban Coast Institute and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean. And uh, I'm Tom Harrington, your moderator for today's webinar. Um, for many years, sediment dredge from coastal navigation channels has mostly been disposed in the least costly manner, um, often discharged offshore in confined disposal facilities, removing sediments from the natural coastal system. So it's now recognized that sand and other coastal sediments are a limited natural resource that enhances or that needs to be conserved through somewhat of a regional management plan in a way that enhances our natural sediment processes and provides cost-effective environmental restoration and coastal protection for long-term uh, coastal sustainability. So we thought this was a timely topic, and today we're fortunate to be joined by three leaders in sediment management issues. We have Ms. Monica Chaston from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Mr. William Dixon of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, and Mr. Bill Hansen of the Great Lake Dredge and Dock Company. Uh, before we begin the webinar, I thought I'd go over a few housekeeping um, items. Uh, first, we'll start the webinar uh, with each presenter providing uh, 10 to 12 minutes of comments. Uh, after their presentations, we'll have hopefully 15 to 20 minutes available for question and answers from the participants. Um, so if you do have a question, we ask that you hold your question to the end. Uh, actually, at any time during the webinar, if you'd like, you could type a question into the chat bar on the left sidebar of the screen. And uh, after the last presentation, uh, Carl will, will scroll through and read through the questions uh, to our presenters uh, for them to answer. Uh, if you do have a, a clarification question that can't wait, um, certainly type it into the chat and we'll uh, try to get that clarification during the presentation. Uh, but otherwise, if, if you'd all hold your questions to the end, uh, and then we'll, we'll go through them sequentially and ask as many as we have time for. So with that, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Ms. Monica Chasen. Uh, Monica is a, a project manager with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Philadelphia District in the Operations Division. She has over 33 years of experience with hydraulic and coastal engineering projects, specializing in dredging, beach nourishment, tidal inlets, regional sediment management, and coastal structures. Ms. Chasen's current responsibilities include serving as the project manager for coastal navigation projects in the New Jersey and Delaware state regions and for the district's five dams located in Pennsylvania. Ms. Chasen received a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Drexel University and a Master's of Science in Hydraulic and Coastal Engineering from Lehigh University. And with that, Monica, you're set to go. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank Dr. Harrington, the Urban Coast Institute, and Marco for the opportunity to present. Uh, our agency has been involved with regional sediment management as a program for almost 20 years now, and our district is excited to show off some of, the effort, some of our efforts that have actually come to fruition. So first, I'd like to um, give a, a brief overview of the Regional Sediment Management Program nationally. Uh, Linda Lillycrop is our program manager, and the program was born out of a Coastal Engineering Research Board charge back in 1999. So that's really when it became a program in the Corps. And it, the charge was to really look at a systems approach um, in the coastal area and then in the inland area um, to more effectively manage sediment. So one of the primary goals is to view sediment as a resource, as an asset, and um, for many of you on the call, your, your background is probably in the coastal region where sand is often scarce and seen as, as very valuable, and that's been my background for many years. About 10 years ago, I moved into the navigation arena where we were dealing with uh, more fine grain material and sometimes sediment is seen as trash or debris. So it's uh, been kind of a charge to take a look at changing philosophy. I'm getting a little bit of an echo, Carl. Yes, if anyone's on there who has 
both called in and has their computer going, please turn off your speakers. Mute the line. Thank you. Um, so RSM, um, the primary goal is to keep sediment in the system, and this slide shows some of the goals and the strategies used to do that. Um, it's not just about beaches, though, and it's not just about beneficial use. This is a busy slide, but it shows that there's a lot going on in the CORE's RSM national program. We have over 30 districts, both coastal and inland districts, that participate in the program, and a multitude of partners, um, as shown on the slide, and, and, and a lot of the R&D programs collaborate with the RSM program. Another program um, that is, a, is one that collaborates with the RSM program is the Engineering with Nature program. That's also run out of our Engineering Research and Development Lab in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Um, EWN brings a, a similar science-based approach looking at triple win outcomes, economic, environmental, and social outcomes for our environment and for some of our Corps of Engineers projects. Philly, uh, our Philadelphia district is one of three engineering na with nature proving grounds across the country, and so we're trying to develop projects and work together with ERDIC to develop a better engineering with nature program. So a persistent approach. I say persistent because, again, the, the Corps has been in the RSM program business for about 20 years now. And sometimes progress has been slow. Um, it's changing philosophy, it's finding funds to do better, improve practices. Um, and then nothing like a good storm uh, comes along and brings in some of those things, a change of philosophy, the need to build in coastal resilience into our projects and into our systems, and the funds to go along with it. So some of the projects I'm going to be showing you today were born out of both long-term strategies, but then short-term strategies to, to, uh, for post-Sandy work. Easy projects first. The navigation channels that we have along the coast, uh, several of them are in tidal inlets, and they shoaled in following the storm, but also long-term, we have a chronic shoaling problem in these inlets. So over the years, we've been able to uh, use the, the the vessel that's shown in the middle of this slide, the Currituck or its sister boat, the Muradin, to take sediment out of our channels and instead of disposing of it, to place it in the near shore where it does support either a federal beach nourishment project or the coast in general. Um, these are a little bit easier, I'd say, because they're sand and, and the mindset is there to, to do this practice. Our newest project on the right, so I don't want to just concentrate all in New Jersey, is Roosevelt Inlet, Delaware, and Lewis Beach, Delaware. This project was recently completed in February of 2018 and was a, a new way to dredge the material out of the inlet and place it in the near shore for the Lewis Beach, Delaware project, and that was working with DENREC. Um, so moving on to the fine grain material, we're really trying to look at ways, as Tom mentioned, to not confine the material. The upper left photo shows a CDF on the marsh in New Jersey. And to look at the way some of our other sister districts in the core, such as Baltimore and Mobile and New Orleans, are, are placing material in open water and really using it beneficially. That was kind of the mindset and the mantra as we started some of these projects. So the three example projects I'm going to quickly go through are along the New Jersey Intracoastal Waterway, which is a 117-mile-long shallow draft federal channel that runs along the, the backside of the barrier islands in New Jersey. These three projects are going to represent a mixture of different sediment types. Um, Ring Island was all sand. Mordecai Island was a mixture of sand and fines. And then uh, Avalon was mostly fine grain material. So Mordecai Island is located to the west of Long Beach Island in New Jersey, um, and it's, it's a poster child for both RSM and EWN actions. The blue line is that portion of the New Jersey intercoastal that runs along the backside of Long Beach Island. And in the past, the practice in the core was to dredge that channel and place the material in, in the Parker's Island confined disposal facility. And that CDF is very small and was shared by the locals 
and the state. So it was a problem, reduced capacity. Um, at the same time, in the Corps of Engineers, there was a study to do an ecosystem restoration project for Mordecai Island. You can see that Mordecai is split into two pieces, a very small sliver and then a larger por portion of the island. So that project was working with Bill Dixon's office, the state of New Jersey, and the Mordecai Land Trust to restore that. And in a combined approach, we um, dredged the channel. Instead of going to the CDF, we placed in between the two sections of island shown in the orange here to try and restore that island. And again, the partnerships and a lot of the work was, were already in place so that we could just implement the strategy from a navigation standpoint. Um, the project was constructed in November of 2015. Um, a small 12 to 14 inch hydraulic pipeline dredge filled the breach between those two slivers of island. And we did learn a lot of lessons. I don't have time to go into everything here, but one of the key things that I learned in this project was the use of a turbidity curtain. I, I, got a, I learned this from the Mobile District where they had used a similar product. And this curtain actually um, held in place the 20% of the fines that were in the material and also protected the valuable SAVs that were to the east of the project area. We originally were going to pull that curtain, but we've left it in place because it has helped to stabilize the project. And here you can see various three months, 10 months, and two years following construction of that project. Um, the good news is we we built a great project, and there, there has been um, an amazing amount of success with birds using this area. We originally planted it, assuming that the objective was to stabilize the island, but they found this nice, beautiful sand and shell area, and have, um, we've had great success with least turn skimmers and oyster catchers along this project. So we had to change our objective a little bit. The island was originally built too low for bird habitat, and in December of 2017, we, we went in and fine-tuned it. We adaptively managed it to raise it and have it more successful for the nesting birds. The next two projects I'll go through very quickly, um, but I just wanted to acknowledge all of the partners involved in these next two, Ring Island and Avalon, New Jersey. The lands in both projects are owned by the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we constructed the projects using emergency supplemental O&M funds from the navigation side of the house, but there was also a National Fish and Wildlife foundation grant to the agencies that you see on these slides, on the slide including the Nature Conservancy, State of New Jersey, and Green Trust Alliance. And they've been huge partners in these two projects. The contractor for this is Barnegat Bay Dredging out of Harvey Cedars, New Jersey. So the first project, Ring Island, had two purposes. Uh, the first and primary was to construct some upland habitat on a section of degraded marsh for um, oyster catchers and black skimmers. There was also a component that tested thin layer placement using sand. This material was 96% sand. We've had great success also with this project. Um, tons of shorebird usage, horseshoe crabs came, terrapins came. Um, and after three years of the project on the ground, since we were successful at raising the project at Mordecai, it was decided pretty quickly that we would try and raise it. And we just finished that project in March of 2018. And again, we're seeing the birds come back, and, and we're hoping this adaptive management placement technique um, is going to prove successful for the future projects. Um, Avalon the, is, a, is another project with the same partners. The blue line is the New Jersey Intracoastal Waterway that runs to the west of Avalon. And we, this was one of the most critically shoaled areas of that waterway along the whole 117-mile reach. So the project was to dredge the channel, mostly fine grain material, pipeline it over to the red sections uh, in a thin layer placement approach to restore this degraded marsh. The first, uh, this is a key point here, the, the first phase of this, we did this as a pilot with a very small amount of material, 5,000 cubic yards, minimal containment on the marsh to see how it worked, see how the material worked, how it ran get our technique down. That then informed a larger pilot project of 45,000 cubic yards 
uh, where there was much more containment, um, much more pre-placement data, and the costs and lessons learned for that project, this entire project, are under development right now. A report should be coming out um, hopefully in the near future by the grant team. And the monitoring both from the core side of the house and the grant team side will be con continuing for several years. Okay, so uh, just to hit on a key few final points, monitoring lessons learned and future opportunities. One of the key things in our approaches have been to commit to monitoring, developing lessons learned, and then looking for those low-hanging fruit right, opportunities. Um, Avalon has been a test bed for research and development. These are a couple of work units coming out of the core again. side of the house, but the grant team is also doing a lot of monitoring on this project site. And again, this will continue for a few years. And I can't stress enough the boots on the ground and the sharing of lessons learned. It's, it's been, uh, these have been criti critical projects involving multiple agencies, um, universities, consultants. Point to the end, just make sure. Dredging contractors. Um, and, and then taking these lessons learned oh, and see. having workshops mm -hmm. and sharing them. I see where the. I'm sorry, I think somebody's phone's not on mute. Um, so again, you know, sharing of lessons learned is something that we, we are uh, excited about. And if you have additional questions after the, after the webinar, please feel free to contact me. So a few key points. Um, we believe that our navigation mission is now succeeding on very small, limited funds for these shallow draft projects by working together with shore protection and ec ecosystem restoration projects. Partnering on these are critical. And there are plenty more opportunities. Um, some are low-hanging fruit. Other ones are a little more challenging. But we are investigating uh, a number of them right now. I am a firm believer that we shouldn't be doing some of these beneficial use projects in large scale until we learn a little bit more. So the smaller pilot efforts, I think, are proving successful for us to lead to larger actions. Um, evaluating everything site-specific. I know a lot of people are wanting to cookbook some of this information. and I still feel that project-specific and site-specific remain key, but every project has a different level of risk. Some are lower risk, some are higher risk to try some of these new and innovative techniques. Uh, the, the momentum in New Jersey is huge right now. The New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection um, is excited about some of these projects now and is working with us to find more. But they do take time, they take money, and they take um, commitment and persistence to overcoming the challenges and committing to the monitoring and lessons learned in the future. And finally, one of my biggest soapbox points right now is to test sediment up front. This, uh, as I mentioned before, the sand is the easiest, but to really understand the content of the sediment and how it's going to um, move on these projects and behave on these projects is key before you start one. And then finally, constructability up front, um, talking to both the regulators and, and most importantly, right now, the dredging industry. I know we have Bill Hansen on the call today, but talking to contractors up front to see what is actually buildable with the sediment that you have and the location that you have is, is key. So with that, I'm going to end it. I know I, I apologize. I probably went a little bit long. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Harrington. Thank you, Monica. That was great. Um, okay, so our second speaker today is William Dixon. Uh, Bill is the director of the Division of Coastal Engineering with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, Engineering and Construction. Uh, Bill has been with the department for 30 years. As director, he's responsible for the management and administration of the state's shore protection program, Bayshore Floodgate, and aids to navigation facilities. Bill's role also includes representing the DEP as the local sponsor on all federal shore protection projects storm damage reduction projects, and environmental restoration projects along the coastline. Uh, this includes being the liaison between the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the state's municipalities. Um, and do we have the screen? Hold on a second. Monica Walter, oh, there they go. OK, I see it queuing up now. Oh, 
All set. Is that good, Carl? Yep, I see the state of New Jersey's shore protection program. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Dixon. Uh, I want to thank Tom Harrington, Monmouth University, and Marco for uh, this opportunity to present. And <clears throat> um, before I kind of get started, uh, I want to echo what Monica said. This is the, all these projects, both navigation and shore protection and RSM for, for both of those types of projects, it, it's, these projects are more of a marathon than a sprint. These projects are, are long-term authorized projects that remain authorized uh, indefinitely. So um, this is more of an evolution than a one-time thing. Um, <clears throat> so I want to echo what Monica said. Um, <clears throat> so th this is just our chain of command um, as far as within the state of New Jersey. Um, our, um, and the way, so our, my division has a specific goal in uh, providing resilience and reducing uh, storm damages along the coast. That's both on the <clears throat> both along the Atlantic coast and the back bays, and we're we're able to do that through uh, dedicated funding, annual dedicated funding. Um, that is what allows us to partner with the Army Corps of Engineers on these long-term projects, and uh, the Shore Protection Fund has enabled us to be able to partner with the core and study and get congressional authorization for all these projects shown on this screen. Um, <clears throat> of those projects, there are 17 are congressionally authorized beach nourishment, beach and dune uh, nourishment projects that include both initial construction and periodic nourishment. In addition, <clears throat> what we're de the large, uh, sh this large shaded area here is a current study that we are under study with the Corps of Engineers for to address uh, back bay flooding issues. And included in that study is uh, How to, is habitat type improvements that can provide resiliency. And uh, one of the things I want to investigate in that study is uh, beneficial or use of dredge material um, to achieve that goal as well. Uh, so as I said, there are 17 congressionally authorized uh, projects currently in New Jersey. Um, that, that require sand. Twelve of them are constructed. Three are currently under construction, and two were, were, uh, are remaining to receive funding. The renourishment cycle is two to seven years. So for all those projects that we previously saw, all these projects, <clears throat> they all require sand <clears throat> and in and they require renourishment sediment as well. So <clears throat> right now, these, these areas here are the approved, currently approved borrow areas for sand resource for <clears throat> uh, beach, beach and dune nourishment <coughs> along the Atlantic coast in New Jersey. As you can see, these these areas are relatively small compared to the length of the coastline and the amount of sediment that we need to manage uh, these projects. So of those borrow areas, seven are within inlet <coughs> and are renewable borrow areas. So, so those, those borrow areas provide 
two benefits. We can uh, provide sand for the beach and also do some navigation maintenance at when we are dredging. And the benefit of those, those, um, <clears throat> those borrow areas is that they're renewable. Um, <clears throat> some of the other things we're doing with, uh, with sand is we're doing backpassing. Uh, one of the projects that's authorized is authorized solely as a backpassing project, which is in uh, Wildwood, New Jersey, or the Wildwoods. That project is we're moving forward to construction. We're currently in the real estate acquis acquisition phase. But that is going to be the first large-scale backpassing project done at the federal level um, in New Jersey. So we're looking forward to that because uh, we don't need to go offshore for the sand. The other, other municipalities have done some beach backpassing from these projects as well to manage the sediment within the project area. Um, we're looking to do that on a larger scale uh, in the future. That's one of the things we're looking for to do in the future, and we're going to look to see how the Wildwoods project progresses and the costs associated with it and the technology that industry can provide um, <clears throat> to, to, to see how cost effective that is. <clears throat> Some of the other uh, advantages to RSM for these projects is the large shipping channels, both for New York, New Jersey Harbor and Delaware Bay, Delaware River. Um, we have done projects. Um, one was direct beach placement from channel maintenance dredging. The other was, uh, the other is, um, we did brief we did channel dredging in Sandy Hook and took that material and we couldn't place it on the beach at the time, so we placed it in the borrow area where once we obtain funding for the beach project, we could harvest that sand. <clears throat> Small channel maintenance dredging projects like Monica described, whenever it, it is possible, we try and place the sand either directly on the beach or in the near shore so it can get within the uh, littoral drift system and get the sand up on the beach as much as possible. Back bay channels, we, so when we dredge some channels that we have sand, we do direct pump onto the beach and that has been done both by the Corps and by by my office and it's also being done by uh, New Jersey DOT. So here's some examples. This is the Oakwood Beach project. This is uh, the Delaware shipping channel. Uh, here's the borrow area and the sand was placed on Oakwood Beach. This is a storm damage reduction project. And this is a before picture and after picture. So this is a great example of, in my opinion, of, uh, of better use of the sediment than overboard disposal or placing it in a CDF. Another example, this is the Sandy Hook Channel on its approach into uh, New York Harbor. And <clears throat> this is the upper portion of the, the federally authorized uh, Beach Nourishment Project is all of Monmouth County, and it essentially stretches from this location here down to uh, Manasquan Inlet. The drift of sand is to the north, and as you can see, this spit of sand is entering into the federal channel. New York District Corps of Engineers Operations did a project where they took the material from the channel basically an edge shoal in the channel, and placed it in this location here, which is the Sandy Hook, or the Seabright Borrow Area, which this is the entire Seabright Borrow Area that is used for nourishment of the, this project in Monmouth County. <clears throat> Weeks Marine uh, 
did a bucket and barge operation here to clear that channel and they placed the sediment, a portion of the sediment in this pink box in this location uh, using uh, bottom dump scows. So approximately 300,000 cubic yards was placed here last fall and they're currently working on their next round of dredging and they're planning on doing the same activity. This, this is a huge advantage, uh, I think, to the state of New Jersey and to the Corps of Engineers, because previously this material was, was going into an offshore disposal site that we could not uh, dredge within to put it on the beach. So the, I agree with Monica, does not, it, we, we want to keep the sand in the system, not just sand, but the finer grain sediment for some of the back channels. Um, so we're making strides to do that, and we're making advances basically every year towards that goal. Um, some of the challenges uh, that I see is if you remembered the slide I provided to you before. All those near shore renewable borrow areas are in the southern part of the state. In the northern part of the state, uh, we don't really have renewable borrow areas. So we are having to uh, look at long-term sediment for these systems, which is why it's extremely important with any of the core or Navy navigational dredging that if that material can get placed in a borrow area or on the beach, it would provide a benefit uh, to these projects. Um, we're, we're trying to keep the sediment in the near shore and to use sediment in the near shore because it reduced cost and reduced conflicts with other users if we have to go further offshore um, to other locations. One of the challenges is, like I said, direct placement from navigation projects. The um, federal government has funding by business lines. The navigation projects are a different business line than uh, coastal storm risk management or flood risk management projects. So we, we've been working through the challenges of trying to use navigation funds to put sand on the beach or mixing the funds. Uh, so as Monica said, it's lessons learned and we're working, we, we all have the same common goal. It's, it's how we achieve it and uh, we're, we're making strides towards that. Um, one of the issues too is equipment limitations. The core, <coughs> the core's uh, dredge equipment for these small channels uh, cannot provide direct placement on the beach. Uh, they can bottom dump near shore. <clears throat> the other large issue we have is we placed a lot of material up and down the coast. In New Jersey, we placed over 80 million cubic yards of material. Um, sand material for these projects, um, which we now have to manage that material within all these projects up until all these projects are individually authorized and individually funded up until Sandy, uh, only a portion of them were constructed. Post Sandy, they will all be constructed. So, so now we have to look at where is that sand going? How, do we, how can we keep that sand in the, in the littoral drift system uh, longer and if once it gets out of the toll drift system, how can we, uh, how can we, what engineering and industry solutions are available to recapture that sand versus going to offshore borrow areas? <clears throat> the other issue is bypass and backpassing. The <clears throat> we want to build a, a bypass uh, project, however, ownership of the sand reservoir is uh, proving to be a problem. It's difficult to get approvals from private property owners or governmental agencies that manage that area um, 
to take their sand away and move it to another location. Um, so that is proven to be challenging. Also, backpassing of sand. If, if the entire beach is municipally owned, it's very easy. But if you have to deal with private property owners, getting authorization to mine material on private property uh, is a challenge as well. And the other real issue is, is it economically feasible to do large-scale backpassing? And we'll, we'll find that out over time. One, uh, another issue that is becoming challenging is the Coastal Barrier Resource Act. That is limiting the ability to use, um, <clears throat> to use federal dollars uh, for certain types of federal spending. There, we have one borrow area that has been mapped in a COBRA zone that we are now are no longer able to use federal uh, coastal storm risk management dollars um, to borrow sand out of there. And I'm wondering how that's going to, this expansion of the COBRA zones, how that's going to affect um, some of the uh, unique um, habitat restoration projects that Monica and the department are trying to achieve. <clears throat> That's all I have. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, so our final speaker this morning is Bill Hansen. Uh, Bill Hansen is Vice President for Government Relations at Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company, where he represents the company in international, federal, state, and local policy decisions related to the dredging industry issues. Uh, Bill currently serves uh, on the Texas A&M Board of Industry Advisors and the Texas A&M Board of the Engineering Experiment Station. Uh, he's chairman of the NOAA Hydrographic Services Review Panel, an executive committee board member of the American Shore and Beach Preservation Association, a board member of the National Waterways Council, a distinguished diplomat of navigation engineering of the Academy of Coastal Ocean Port and Navigation Engineering, and is a past appointed civilian board member of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Coastal Engineering Research Board. Uh, Bill holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Ocean Engineering from Texas A&M, and he'll tell us all about the industry uh, perspective on this issue. Bill? <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. And uh, as usual, uh, Monica and uh, Bill Dixon do all the hard work, and then uh, we get to come in and do the fun part, uh, actually building the projects. Uh, a lot of stuff that uh, uh, Monica and Bill talked about, uh, it, it ends up being the, the drudgery, if you will, getting the planning, getting all the folks uh, to the table. And then uh, we look at ways that we can uh, either use existing equipment, uh, uh, you know, fairly common methodology to construct the projects, or we will look at uh, adapting uh, or building new equipment, new technologies, if, if need be. Uh, for background, uh, uh, Great Lakes Dredging Dock is the uh, largest dredging company in the U.S., 128-year-old company. Uh, and uh, we work on the mega projects from deepening seaports uh, uh, around the world, and, and, uh, but also smaller projects. We've taken recently to doing projects uh, in the back bays of New Jersey, as well as reservoir projects uh, uh, in Kansas and Illinois as well. And uh, I think one of the common themes that uh, from both talks uh, to, uh, before me uh, were that uh, you know, dredge material is a resource, and that's something that we can't overstate. Uh, I think probably everyone on the call here has spent time correcting someone who is called dredge material spoil. And, and if you're laughing about that, I just had to do it twice this morning already. I'm down at State of the Coast uh, uh, conference here in New Orleans, and it's just when, when people refer to dredge material as spoil, uh, I think we, we kind of take a step backwards. So it really needs to be a resource. And a lot of the groups we work with, Tom mentioned several of them that uh, we're involved with, uh, that's become kind of the, uh, the, the standard bearer, if you will, is that 100% uh, of the beneficial use of uh, dredge material is, is achievable and something we need to work for. Uh, and we've seen uh, great results uh, with folks like uh, Monica and Bill uh, out uh, trumpeting their successes and, and talking about the, 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 the things they're able to do at a small scale and at a large scale. Um, 
So a beneficial use uh, really for us is all about collaboration. And, and again, both Monica talked about that and her, uh, the, the wide variety of folks involved in it. And then uh, one of the things that we think is essential to making, helping the system work uh, is having a state level group. And we always uh, use New Jersey DEP as an example. Uh, because New Jersey has been a leader in, in this type of work. They have a, a state fund, that the annual fund, that helps pay for some of the uh, cost share uh, on, on these projects. And they also have a, a state DEP who actually advocates for the work uh, as well. So you've got a great partnership between uh, the Corps and the state, and it's a nice example for others around the country. Um, we do believe that uh, uh, a couple other things that were talked about earlier is uh, uh, every dredging project, uh, and, and I know we've got some international folks on the call, but every project uh, in the U.S. Or, or even internationally is an opportunity for research, and it should be uh, considered as such. And when we go off and, and do uh, try a different technique or a different uh, uh, method, that we study it. And as Bill said, it's the okay, case. So you put all the sand on the beach in New Jersey. We build every project uh, to its full dimensions. Uh, it's not just a matter of building it and you're done. You, you have to monitor it, study it, and have a better understanding because lessons learned uh, locally can apply elsewhere as well. Uh, <clears throat> regional sediment management uh, is probably the best thing the Corps is doing uh, for those who may not uh, be familiar with it, it's basically taking a look at uh, not just a project, but a system, a system of projects uh, that can be combined and perhaps take advantage of uh, both dredge material, but also cost efficiencies. Uh, one of the other challenges that, that I would throw out to, to this group is to not assume that beneficiaries of dredge material has to cost more. Uh, we have found, working around the country, that when you get stakeholders at the table, uh, uh, that that uh, lots of times the uh, projects can be done with a cost savings, and and that means you get the dredgers, the regulators, uh, the NGOs, you get the property owners sitting at the table and and looking at uh, what what it is they're trying to achieve. Uh, that there is a lot of commonality that can help uh, uh, keep the cost under control and not get into those. Uh, 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 negative discussions <laughs> that keep good things from happening. Uh, I'm just going to mention a couple other things. Uh, I, mean, I guess we're going to go to questions, but uh, something recently happened and, and uh, uh, a couple years ago in, in uh, legislation uh, in the United States that uh, called for the core uh, to build 10 pilot projects uh, uh, for beneficial use of dredge material. And uh, we suspect at the time that the Corps actually had many more than 10 projects in mind that, that could be proposed uh, to be done. And uh, uh, sure enough, uh, when the proposals went out, uh, or were received by the Corps, they actually received 94 proposals from around the country. And, and mind you, this is given a very limited time frame. They were only given 30 days to submit. And, and uh, CORE actually wasn't even able to submit their own projects. It was uh, the, the partners, the local states and, and local users who were required to submit them. So we suspect there's uh, several hundred more projects out there that are doable and very interesting. And so we're going to be tracking those, uh, that process. Uh, for those of you into those kind of details, it's called the 1122 section of the order 2016. And, and the Corps, uh, I believe, is going to be making some announcements here over the next few weeks about those projects. But it'll be interesting to track those and, and see which projects actually can get built. Um, uh, funding uh, is always an issue for these projects. Uh, and uh, again, I would just challenge folks to not make that be a, let that be a, an impediment. Uh, ultimately, good infrastructure. It doesn't uh, care if it's federal, state, or private money. Uh, they just want it to get done. So uh, we'd like folks to think bigger. Uh, and then finally, uh, we need to have these projects, uh, as in 1122 stuff I just mentioned, those projects to be shovel and research ready. Because we never know when the money's coming. We never know uh, when a 
uh, president's going to take an interest in it, or the governor's going to take an interest in it, or a mayor. So uh, if, if we start studying after the money becomes available, it's too late. Uh, we need to get up front and have these things ready to pull off the shelf. Uh, and, and again, I, I think I would ask uh, you can, to continue to engage with dredging contractors. Uh, uh, we, we, we're the ones that actually do the work. Uh, we have the equipment. We have the know-how. We have the people. And uh, we've got some pretty reasonable ideas if given the opportunity to, to offer them. So uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Hankton for including us in the uh, webinar today. And uh, I'll stand down at this point. Thanks. Okay. We have some questions in the queue, Tom. So I'll just go back and read them um, in order. And the first one here was directed toward Monica, and it's from Jenna Phillips, who asks, what were some issues that you ran into with thin layer placement? How were you able to control the placement and confine material so as to avoid sensitive vegetation? Thank you. OK. Um, you can see my screen right now, right? Yes. OK. Let's just go to this slide. I, I called up our, our list. Let me see if I can get it into slideshow. Um, we've had, uh, through the RSM program, a thin layer placement university type uh, event. It was about a year ago in June. And we raised some of the challenges and lessons learned from thin layer placement. So this is, this is the list that I came up with for, for that particular meeting. So there, there's a lot of them. Um, the big, one of the biggest questions our regulatory groups are dealing with is what actually constitutes a degraded marsh. And again, I think that goes back to site-specific and sediment-specific and, and what can you do to improve what you perceive as a degraded marsh and will the agencies support that. Definition of thin is a, is a big option or a, a big question. Is it a foot? Is it three inches? Um, and there, I, there's a long list here, but I think um, construction-wise, one of the challenges is, uh, depending on your sediment type when you're in the field, how do you actually spread it over a large area in a, in a thin way that you've designed to? Um, that's one area that we definitely need more industry help. We've talked about maybe the agricultural industry being able to help us with that. All of these things will help get the cost down to doing more of these projects. Um, how did we contain it? For the Avalon project, we contained it with core logs. They were designed by the grant team that I had mentioned that was supporting that project. Um, Princeton Hydro and uh, Greenvest were involved with the actual design of the placement and, and the placement of the placement, too. It was extensive. There's going to be a lessons learned document coming out. I don't want to speak for them in terms of what that's going to say relative to containment, but I, I think a little less containment is probably going to be the mindset into the future. Baltimore District for containment of thin layer, I believe they use mostly just hay bales, a very simple approach. And finally, last week, or a few weeks ago, I should say, I got out to um, Pepper Creek, Delaware. That's a project that's been on the ground for many years now. Um, I think Allison Rogerson's on the phone, and, and they use much less containment and have a very successful thin layer placement project. So I think there's variation out there, and we're still all learning from each other. All right. The next question came up during Bill Dixon's presentation from Frank Provenzano, who um, is from Tuckerton, and asks, a town has a grant did sediment testing and hoped to place the material from our lagoons on the Forsyth Wildlife Refuge. Um, what I was told at first Forsyth said yes, now they said no. How can we get the Forsyth people to understand that if uh, three to four feet placed on the refuge would not hurt the wildlife area? I understand your question. Four inches, I guess. Uh, th so the, this this, this again is gets back to what I said of, as far as an evolution. Uh, the, the types of uh, projects that Monica has done recently, we, we have previously attempted to do them many, many years ago and uh, were not able to due to various regulations and mindsets. Um, 
the Mordecai Island project actually changed the way the state's reg we, we actually modified the state's regulation to allow for what's called living shoreline, which allows for the use it basically allows for the use of dredge material to rebuild marsh areas that previously existed in the state. So uh, um, it's a challenge. Uh, the, the more levels of government that are involved and levels of regulations that are involved, obviously, the more challenging it is. Um, my recommendation would be a lot of the area, other areas around Tuckerton are within DEP's control. Uh, Great Bay Wildlife Management Area, Great Bay Boulevard Wildlife Management Area. There may be opportunities to put the material at that location versus the Forsyth Refuge. I'm not sure. My recommendation would be to, to directly speak and meet with the refuge manager and what's in their management plan. They, they, they have specific regulations they need to follow for the refuge, and it's based upon their management plan. Bill, I believe this one also came up during your presentation, and it's from Jennifer Steele, who says, my question is permitting uh, slash conservation of sediment resource perspective. When placing dredge material into an existing borrow area, is there a conservation plan for that borrow area written such that the dredge material is used prior to the remainder of the permitted borrow area? This is the first time we have done such an activity where we have taken material and placed it back into a borrow area uh, directly. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we've thought that far ahead. So the material that we placed there was about 300,000 cubic yards. The typical contract for renourishment is probably in the magnitude of 800 to 2 million cubic yards of material, depending upon the funding that we have. Uh, so right now, there isn't enough material from navigation dredging placed back in that borrow area for a full renourishment project. Um, but we will. What happens is that that Seabright borrow area is very large. Uh, compared to all of our, our other borrow areas. And each contract that comes up for renourishment, we will sit down with the core, we'll sit down with um, the New Jersey Geologic Survey and determine what, what, is the, what portion of the borrow area should be used for what portion of the project. So it, right now I don't have an answer to your question other than we'll have to see when the next funding uh, stream comes to do a renourishment of that project. This also came up during your presentation, but possibly um, anyone can jump in on it. And that is, and it's from Matt Gove, who asks, what is the ballpark breakdown of core projects using sediment from reuse versus sediment from offshore borrow sites? Like a percentage? And I, I'm assuming that's uh, for New Jersey versus the country, or maybe it's for both. Um, and Bill, you, percentage would be great. Um, you can chime in. I, I, my one comment in New Jersey would be um, the volume of material sold in the in the navigation channels is is relatively small compared to the offshore borrow sites and the amount needed for the beach fills. I don't know if you have a percentage still on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a percentage either. I never never really kind of looked at it that way. I, I would assume it's, we're certainly under 10%, um, but we're looking to, th that gets back to some of the challenges. Like I said, uh, we're working towards trying to use the Delaware Delaware River, Delaware Bay material in some of these projects or place them in borrow areas where it can be used, where right now that's not being done. That's one of the challenges I'm working towards and I'm working towards also expanding in New York District and New York Harbor 
use of that sand as well. So this, this gets back to the issue of this is kind of an evolution and a marathon. Um, but currently, what we try to do is when we're using, especially when we're using an inlet borrow area for uh, beach nourishment or renourishment, we're also designing that uh, the cut lines that the contractor must do that would also maximize uh, navigation. So I, I guess what I should say is so these borrow, these inlet borrow areas are not just the size of the channel because there isn't enough material to meet the demand that's needed on the beach. Uh, so for, for those inlet borrow areas, all, all the sand, 100%, goes on to the beach, um, but what would be required for navigation is a lesser percentage of that total. So I, I don't know if, if I had to throw a number out there off the top of my head, I would say um, no more, no greater than 10% at this point. Yeah, and this is Bill Hanson. I go ahead and add to the, maybe not just from a New Jersey perspective, but from a national perspective, because we've looked at uh, uh, the number of the projects the Corps did around the country a couple years ago, and I think it was. 60% of those projects had some element of beneficial use, uh, you know, not necessarily by volume and all that, but uh, that you know, beneficial use was being considered, was being attempted on on 60% of the projects. So that, that was a pretty good number. And I can tell you that uh, down in uh, uh, Mississippi River here, where I'm at right now, that uh, we're upwards of 70% of the material that's dredged in the Mississippi River right every year is is going to create land. Uh, so being beneficially reused. So that's a big turnaround from where we were, say, uh, uh, 10 years ago. Another question from Matt Gove, which um, I think any of you can answer if you have an opinion on it. And that is, is there a role for um, Marco or the larger Mid-Atlantic Regional Planning Body in helping facilitate, communicate, collaborate, research, et cetera, beneficial uh, sediment reuse projects. Any of you have an opinion on that? Yes. <laughs> I think uh, from the core's perspective, you know, that I showed that one busy slide with all the partners involved, and I know Linda um, is involved with some of the, the more national-related uh, organizations for, you know, ocean, ocean observing and um, so I think where it fits in, I'm, I'm not sure yet. We'd have to look at the, the goals and objectives and the ability to partner, but um, that's key to the RSM approach. Yeah, Bill Hansen here. I'll, I'll uh, second that as well. And, and, and actually, uh, I, with all due respect, uh, uh, I wouldn't wait for the core uh, because uh, the, the, the stakeholders have a uh, much freer reign on what they can say and how they can say it. Um, and, and so promoting uh, uh, this concept is absolutely key. Uh, it's one of the reasons we, we've got these all these co collaboratives we, we try to work through is because the message is, is, uh, uh, is much larger than that than, than what we've done in the past. Uh, if I could just tell another story from down here in Louisiana. I was, at dinner with last night, the guy who's uh, in the marketing, and, and he knows a lot about what we're doing uh, in terms of coastal restoration and beneficial use of dredge material in, in Louisiana, which is really phenomenal, uh, mostly because it's funded by uh, by the oil spill. But the fact that this work is out there and, and, and getting done, yet most folks in the Gulf and Louisiana don't know what we're doing, how we're doing, or why we're doing it. And, and this is a, you know, a series of projects that are that are, are monumental in their scope. And so to the extent that stakeholders uh, uh, at the regional level, level can, can help uh, uh, publicize and, and uh, tell a good story, it, it absolutely helps getting the electeds uh, to pay more attention to what we're doing. I, I agree with what Bill just said. Um, it's, the, especially when it comes to federal dollars, the uh, congressional representatives, they want to hear what 
the interest the uh, interest groups uh, are interested in and and what makes sense for for their for their constituents so uh, it it does make sense that it comes not just from the, the state and core level all right Tom you have any final wrap-up thoughts now I'd just like to thank our uh, three presenters for taking the time to speak with us today uh, it's a wealth of knowledge that uh, they they've provided and uh, uh, overall, I, I think the webinar was a, a, a pretty good overview of where we are with the state of regional sediment management and beneficial reuse and, and the challenges and needs to really push this along as we move forward. So thank you all for, for joining us.